Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Incognito Islamic Productions. Today we want to look at why was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam polygamous. Now Muslims often ask as to why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had more wives at one time than what is allowed for common Muslims, meaning four. Some of them even yell obscenities, alleging that these were sensual passions that made the Prophet ﷺ polygamous. Can there be any greater lie? For the complete understanding of the issue, consider the following points. Certain things were specific for the Holy Prophet ﷺ only. Let it be clear that this was not the only thing particular to the Holy Prophet ﷺ. In fact, there were many. For instance, as we Muslims believe that prayers at night when it's time to hajjud is a great deed of piety, still for us, common Muslims, it is not obligatory. But it was a required act for the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As we find in the Quran in Surah 17, 79 and also Surah 73 verses 2 to 4. And it is really demanding to get out of bed and offer late night prayers and that too regularly, not missing without a genuine reason. This is only to refute the notion that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, God forbid, himself created some exceptions for himself. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't marry out of his physical desires. He did not marry more women out of his physical desires for he had only one wife even to the age of 54. Up until 50, he had only one wife, Sayyidah Khadija, who was 15 years his senior and was twice widowed before. And for the next four years after her death, his only wife was Sayyidah Sauda, also an aged lady. All but one of his wives were either widows or divorced. It was only at the age of 55 that four wives gathered in his marriage. John Baggett Glub admits this fact in his following words when he writes, it is, however, worthy to note that of all of his wives, only Aisha was a virgin when he married her. Zainab bin Josh was a divorced wife and all the rest were widows. Some of them, it would seem, not particularly attractive. Moreover, the apostle had married Khadija when he was 25 and she was a widow considerably older than he was. He had remained completely faithful to her for 24 years plus years until her death. Further, the same author, he says, in Medina, Muhammad had less and less leisure time and must often have been mentally and physically exhausted, especially as he was in his 50s and lately over 60. These are not the circumstances under which men are interested in the indulgence of extreme sexuality. The assumption that he was a sensualist because he had 11 wives when he died at the age of 62 is therefore not absolutely a foregone conclusion as many have assumed. This is particularly so in view of the fact that he had only one wife until he was 50. All this belies the notion that the last prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam married multiple times for his physical desires. John Davenport asks a valid question that we should consider. He says, and it may then be asked, is it likely that a very sensual man of a country where polygamy was a common practice should be content for 25 years with one wife and she being 15 years older than him? Stanley Lane Poole also writes, he says, to say that Muhammad was voluptuary is false. The simple austerity of his daily life to the very last his hard mat for sleeping on, his plain food, his self-imposed menu work, point him out as an ascetic rather than voluptuary. Another European writer, Thomas Carlyle, commented on this oft-repeated lie about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Muhammad himself, after all that can be said about him, was not a sensual man. We shall err widely if we consider this man as a common voluptuary, intent mainly on base enjoyments, nay, on enjoyments of any kind, 
wisdom behind his marriages. All his marriages had great wisdom behind them. His plural marriages were to practically show all sorts of permissible marriages in Islam and had an extraordinary political benefit for the nascent Muslim community. 1. His marriage with Khadija shows that it is permissible for a person who is a bachelor to marry a widow, to marry a woman who is older than him, for a relatively poor and orphan man to marry a rich woman, for an employee to marry his employer. His relation with Khadija was a perfect show of mutual trust and fidelity. The very fact that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not marry during her lifetime belies all the charges of sensuality. Some jaundice-eyed critics went on to say that it were only Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu financial constraints that kept him away from marrying further during Khadija's lifetime. Stanley Lane Poole himself, a bitter critic of Islam, had to acknowledge the absurdity of such an assertion. And he writes, an attempt has been made to explain away Muhammad's fidelity to Khadija by adducing the motive of pecuniary prudence. Muhammad, they say, was a poor man, Khadija, rich and powerful, connected. Any affair decor on the husband's part would have been followed by divorce and the simultaneous loss of property and position. It is hardly necessary to point out that the fear of poverty, a matter of little consequence in Arabia and at that time, would not restrain a really sensual man for 25 years, especially when it is by no means certain that Khadija, who loved him with all her heart in a motherly sort of way, would have sought a divorce for any cause soever. And this explanation leaves Muhammad's loving remembrance of his old wife unaccounted for. If her money alone had curbed him for 25 years, one would expect him at her death to throw off the cloak, then thank heaven for the deliverance and enter at once upon the rake's progress. He does none of those things. Number two, his marriage to Sauda bin Zama shows that a widower can opt to marry a middle-aged, kind, jolly, and widowed woman who can take care of his children. It was perhaps imperative for the Prophet ﷺ to marry a lady of her age, for then he needed someone to look after his children. 3. He married young and intelligent Aisha bint Abi Bakr, so that she remembers and continues to teach the masses all matters relating to married life and even the rest. This marriage also aimed at fostering his friendly relations with Abu Bakr and also to refute the baseless Arab tradition of not marrying the daughter of one whom you call like a brother. It was also a practical manifestation that one can marry a virgin. Number four, he married Hafsa, the daughter of Omar, to foster better relations with his important companion Omar ibn al-Khattab. Number five, his marriage with Zainab bin Khuzayma, the widow of Ubaidah, who fell as a martyr in the battle of Badr, showed his care for the widows of the martyr and was a practical stimulus for the Muslim men to be sensitive towards the situation of the widows of those martyred in the service of Islam. Six, he married Um Habiba, who was a daughter of the chief of Mecca, Abu Sufyan. This marriage brought him closer to the Umayyads, an important family among the Quraysh. This led to rather smooth and bloodless conquest of Mecca. William Muir acknowledges this motive when he states, the Prophet perhaps farther hoped to make Abu Sufyan, the father of Um Habiba, more favorable to his cause. John Begit Glove also makes an interesting observation on the same lines when he states, he took the trouble to write to the emperor of Abyssinia to send him Um Habiba to be his bride. If his object had been merely to acquire another woman, there must have been hundreds of more attractive brides available in Arabia. Possibly he sent for Um Habiba as a bridge to establish relations with Abu Sufyan, who he had noticed was now adopting a more conciliatory attitude. Number seven, he married Um Salama, 
his only wife who brought children from her previous marriage. Thus the Holy Prophet وسلم, gave a practical example to take care of children that a person's wife has from some other or earlier marriage. This marriage pacified her tribe who were earlier very vehement in opposition of Islam and now they had a relation with the Holy Prophet This led many of that tribe to revise their thinking about Islam. Number eight, he married Zainab bin Jash to uproot the baseless Arab tradition of not marrying the, the divorcees of adopted or not real sons. Islam holds that no matter how dear one is to another, one cannot be just as one son from his own loins. Montgomery Watts, he writes on this matter, a social motive may have outweighed the political one in her case to show that Muhammad had broken with old taboos. Number nine, he married Juwariya bin Haditha to foster his relations with the important Jewish tribes and also to show that Islam allows mixed marriages based on social status. These marriages also show the high regard in which women were held that instead of making them slaves, the Holy Prophet وسلم, married them and thus gave them the high status of mothers of the believers. About the political benefits of this marriage, John Baguette Glub in his aforementioned book writes, This was a purely political marriage, for it won over Bani Mustalaq to Islam more successfully than a battle. Number 10, his marriage to Sophia bin Huyayi, a daughter of the Nudair tribe of Jews, proved a great success in neutralizing the harsh sentiments of a considerable faction of the Jews in Northern Arabia. Montgomery Watt, he writes, there may have been political motive in the unions with the Jewish Sophia and Rehana. Number 11, his marriage with Maimuna resulted in some highly valuable people coming to Islam. In the words of Washington Irving, he says, this was doubtless another marriage of policy, for Maimuna was 51 years of age and a widow, but the connection gained him two powerful prostitutes. One was Khalid ibn Walid, a nephew of the widow and an intrepid warrior. The other prostitute was Khalid's friend, Amr ibn al-As. The fact that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa marriages were for reasons other than alleged sensuality is acknowledged even by prejudiced critics like D.S. Margulyath. He writes, In several of these marriages, it is easy to see that political considerations were dominant. Had Allah Almighty not allowed him to have plural marriages, then many Muslims may not have got many benefits which they actually did. Many strong enemies might not have been pacified. Many matters of Sharia, Islamic law, may not have been explained so well. These were only the wives of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who taught us matters relating to married life and other in-house affairs. Here one must remember that none of the Prophet's male children lived to maturity and only one of his daughters Fatima lived after his death and that was only for six months. In such a situation it would have been virtually a calamity for the Muslim community, the Muslim Ummah, if the Holy Prophet وسلم, did not have these wives, as many teachings would have remained veiled from us in that case. All the above details prove that his marriages were not out of his physical desires, but for other motives, undoubtedly noble and great, at least from the perspective of the Muslim community, as evident from their outcomes. In closing, we want to look at biblical prophets who also had many wives, in fact, too many. According to the Bible, Abraham, peace be upon him, had three wives, Hagar, as we find in Genesis 16.4, Sarah, as we find in Genesis 11.29, and Keturah, as we find in Genesis 25.1. Jacob, peace be upon him, had four wives, Lee, as we find in Genesis 29.23, Rachel, as we find in Genesis 29, 28, Zilpah, as we find in Genesis 30, 9, and Bilhah, as we find in Genesis 33. 
the Bible says about prophet David, and David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron. And there were yet sons and daughters born to David. Second Samuel chapter 5 verse 13. Reading 1 Chronicles chapter 3 verses 1 to 9 makes it known that prophet David, peace upon him, had at least six wives and numerous concubines. About prophet Solomon, peace be upon him, it says, And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. We find in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 3. In conclusion, in fact, all the marriages of the holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had great wisdom behind them, not only for his own time, but also for the times to come. It has great effect with regard to spiritual and social growth of the Muslim Ummah, the Muslim community, which is undoubtedly the best nation as far as family set up is concerned. I wonder what trouble hounds Christians from recognizing the simple truth that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marriages were not for sensual reasons, but other prudential reasons. If Martin Luther can say that, the polygamy of patriarchs Gideon, David, Solomon, and on was a matter of necessity, not of libertinism. Why the same cannot be said of the marriages of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when even many of the diehard critics also recognized the necessities in those cases? I am sure that only if our Christian fellows can put off the goggles of prejudice they would be able to see things in a much realistic and just manner. And indeed, Allah knows best. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.